Dr. Michael Nelson. He's a professor in the computer science department at ODU. Uh, uh, prior to joining ODU, he worked for uh, 11 years with NASA Langley Research Center. He's co-editor of, uh, I'm not going to read all of these, these acronyms, OAI, PMH, so, so I assume some professional journals, and, and his research interests include repository object interaction and alternative approaches to digital preservation, and you can find more about him at his webpage uh, at the Computer Science Department or on Twitter. So let's welcome our speaker. Thank you. Um, as Dimitri said, thanks for having me to start with. Dimitri said, I'm Michael Nelson, I'm in the Computer Science Department. Um, what I'm going to present today is joint work. Uh, Yasmin is the PhD student that does all the all the real work, obviously. And then uh, Michelle Weigel is uh, my colleague, um, also in the CS department. And what I'm here to talk to you today is about combining storytelling and web archives. Now, um, Michelle spoke last year, about a year ago, and about a lot of the activities that are ongoing in the web science and digital libraries. And she mentioned briefly about storytelling. And since then, we've had an IMLS grant funded, and things have really ramped up, and so there's a lot more to report about uh, the business of storytelling. So for the IMLS grant, there are really two aspects to this. The first thing is we are using stories to summarize or provide collection understanding of what exists in web archives. So we're going to look at a service called Archivit in which people build collections. And it's a really great service. We do a lot of collaboration with these people. But it's really difficult if you're not the person that built that collection. It's really hard to convey the essence of what that collection contains. So in essence, what we're doing is collections are big. And we're going to generate stories that are small that summarize the collections. The other aspect of this grant is how do these collections get generated? And the thing is, is generating collections is actually quite difficult. So we want to leverage social media, especially things like stories, which are in, in services like Storify or curated social media, and use those to generate seed URIs, or URLs, that's what you call them, but URIs, uh, for generating a collection prior to an event, or right on the cusp of an event before it occurs. So in essence, that's the idea of taking something that's small and using that to generate something that's big. All right, so I'm having problems with the clicker. So we'll get to stories in just a second. What I want to talk to you about right now is web archives, right? So I don't need to convince you that the web is important for our cultural history. Any kinds of discussion that we have now takes place primarily on the web. TV shows are available on the web. Radio, video, everything that we interact with has at least a web component as its primary, uh, often its primary uh, component. How do we preserve the web? Now the idea is any discussion about the 21st century will have to talk about the web and web archives are going to be a necessary component for historians and scholars to discuss the web. So here is an example of CNN.com, right, a popular news service. And here are screenshots that exist of that page from 2002, 2005, 2009, 2011, of some important events. right? So you know, here's uh, something about Michael Jackson's death. Uh, you know, more importantly, uh, Harold Ramis dying, that's important more of a loss to uh, society than Michael Jackson. Um, but this page exists in the internet. Is anyone familiar or used with the internet archive? Anyone? Uh, aside from people in my group? Right. Uh, all right. So the internet archive, you can go to archive.org. And it's a group in California, a nonprofit organization. And they archive the web. They don't grab everything, but they try to. And they do a really exceptional job. So if you want to see how CNN looked 10, 15 years ago, you can go to archive.org and explore and get an idea of what was popular, what was happening, at least as it existed 
on this page at a given time. Right? And we call these snapshots of archived pages, we call them mementos. And this comes from the Memento Project, a joint project that we have with Los Alamos. Um, and we go to the web archives and we can access these snapshots of how pages had existed, how they existed at uh, various times. So I mentioned the Internet Archive. That was the first. They started in 1996. It's the biggest, it's the most important, it's the most complete. They just crawl the web trying to grab everything that they can. Right? There are a lot of other services that have different collection development policies. So there are some things called, uh, well, for one example, uh, there's a service called archive.is, right? based in Ireland. Uh, Iceland, that's the .is domain. So you can go there and give it, a, anyone can, give it a single uh, URL and it will archive just that page. It won't crawl the whole site, but if there's a page that you want to make sure is archived, you can submit it to archive.is and they'll crawl. The Internet Archive may have crawled it already, but if you want to make sure it's crawled, you can submit it to these on-demand services. There are a lot of national libraries, national archives, especially in places like Europe, that crawl their, their, their uh, top-level domain. So the UK National Archive crawls things in the .uk domain. The, the French um, National Library crawls things in the .fr domain, etc. Europe is actually far ahead in web archiving uh, 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 community. They actually have laws that mandate that they uh, collect things at their top-level domain. And some of the libraries are more open, I mean, some of the web archives are more open than others, but they're crawling tremendous amounts of stuff. But where this is crawling everything it can find, and this is crawling what you submit, here they're just trying to crawl things that exist within their country. Right? And then the last thing that we have, or the last kind of service that we have, is Archivit. Archivit is a subscription-based service. It's actually run by these people at the Internet Archive. Um, but you get a subscription, and you can build your own collections. And a lot of people use this for different purposes. So one is state governments are mandated to archive their own pages, right? And they don't know how to do it, so they get a subscription to archive it. They set up a crawl, and it archives all of the, you know, waterworks pages or something like that. And so the state government pages for the last 10 to 15 years are archived using this service. Another thing that is used is if an event occurs, and a fast-breaking event, so something blows up or there's a storm or some big news event, different organizations, often libraries, but different organizations who have a subscription will create a collection based on the event. So one of the things that we looked at was the Boston Marathon bombing, right? Nobody saw that coming. Or it wasn't a hurricane that you could plan for or something. People will recognize this as an important uh, historical event. And the story is fast evolving, right, as we gained more information and we figured out who the suspects were and then we tried to catch them and so forth. And they're archiving the news related to that event. So that's another way that uh, our archiving is used. The third way is creating collections that are sort of broadly themed, right? So not based on like a state government website, not based on a, a news event that spikes, but another way that they generate collections is based on a broad theme like um, human rights. Right? There are certain groups that are interested in human rights and they have a set of pages and they crawl those trying to capture material related to this event. Um, I mean, to, to this theme. Right. So this is what the front page of Archive it looks like. It's got a pretty page. It advertises these are three separate collections. You can click on those and explore. They have, and I think this has actually changed, they have, what, 5,000 or some collections, something like that now. Um, hundreds of institutions and over 10 billion archived pages. So they have a lot of material. And these people are creating collections all the time. If we click on one of the collections, this is the kind of page that we would see. So this is the 2013 Boston Marathon. I realize it's kind of hard to see. So we have some metadata that says when this collection was created, a short description uh, giving you a hint of what the material is. We have search boxes. Um, we have some categorical information, social media, news coverage, that kind of stuff. 
And then we have pages of what we call seed URIs. These are the URLs that people started to collect. And they decided these were important. They had the news or coverage of this event. And these are the things that we should periodically crawl to capture the essence of this historical event. All right. So with the Boston Marathon bombing, you kind of have an idea of uh, what to expect there. So what's the problem with, the, uh, with these collections? Right. So it's good that we have them, but the problem is, one of the problems is, there are multiple collections, there's, there's a possibility of multiple collections about different themes. So Yasmin is Egyptian, and a lot of the examples that she pulled, uh, uh, generates from, are based on the Egyptian uh, revolution or the Arab Spring in general. So if you wanted to learn more about this event, now three or four, four years old now, you'll go to archive it and you'll find there are actually multiple collections that cover some aspect of this event. Now, you didn't create these collections. In which collection should you go to learn more about this event? This is actually one of the uh, difficult aspects. So for all the nice services that archive it provides, what they don't have is anything that facilitates collection summarization or collection understanding. You go to those three collections and they all kind of look right. Maybe you do need to pull from all of them, but it's hard to parse exactly which collection covers which aspects. So here's a human rights collection. This is generated by the Columbia University Libraries. This is one of about seven human rights collections in, uh, in archive. So we have the title, we have a short description, and then we just have page of, after page of seed URIs. How do I distinguish this collection from all the other collections, right? So I can scroll down and I see some of the metadata about the seed URIs, see the URL, the title, how often it's been captured, the time frames it's been captured. And this is good, it helps, right? But I click on this and now my interface looks like this, right? So essentially for this top level URL, it's telling me it was captured two times in 2011, four times in 2012, three times 2013, etc. This doesn't really facilitate understanding the essence of this collection. Right? Now, if you created this or you're very familiar with ACDA.co, uh, maybe you don't, that's all you need. But I'm betting most of the people here don't have a good idea of what you can expect to find at the other end. Right? So our early attempts to support collection summarization, collection understanding, had a flavor where we tried to summarize everything that's in the collection. So we generated timelines, right? And this is coverage of individual seed URIs from, and this is 2008 to 2011 or something like that. And basically, some pages are being added, some pages stop being crawled, but the volume of the collection sort of overwhelms. You can get general patterns, but it's hard to really understand what's happening. There are other services called tree maps. And this is cool, and this gives you an idea where the size of the box indicates the um, magnitude of a particular category. And I can hover and get an image, and then I click on it, and I can see other portions of this collection but it's not as good as we would hoped. And the idea here is we're trying to summarize everything that's in the collection. And that's actually going to be difficult. When we start talking about thousands, potentially thousands of seed URIs, and over time, perhaps hundreds, if not thousands of mementos or copies of those URIs, quickly we're getting into hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pages in our collection. Then we add the dimension of time. Some of these pages stay the same. Some of them change at a rapid rate. How do I convey to you one human rights collection to another, or one Egyptian revolution collection from another? So the result is con conventional visualization <laughs> methods don't really work in this aspect. We explored a whole bunch of others, aside from the tree map and the timeline and so forth, and they're detailed at that URL. But basically, we ran into a dead, long, a dead end and they did not work well for what we were trying to do. Then we backed up and thought, what about this notion of storytelling, right? 
we think this is going to really hold a key for us. Now, what do we mean by storytelling? Well, if anyone's from the English department, it's going to mean something slightly different, right? We have the protagonist, and they go on a journey, and you know they undergo some change, and there's a re resolution, right? That's not exactly what we're not creating characters, we're not telling jokes or anything. I mean, that would be cool, right? I would love to do that, but that's uh, you know that's uh, that's the next project, right? So we don't really mean it in a conventional literature sense, as cool as that would be. Um, what we really mean, stories in context of social media, mean something slightly scaled down. Um, so, in this case, we have a couple of examples that will uh, work back. Some of these might be familiar to you. So, um, there are a lot of services that are focusing on aspects of storytelling, specifically for social media. Um, anyone use or familiar with Pinterest? Have friends that use Pinterest? Right. Okay, I was going to, anyone willing to admit they use Pinterest? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. you have, some of your friends use Pinterest. Right? Uh, um, and um, there's some things like Scoopit that are sort of like um, personalized uh, newspapers. One of the services that we're really going to focus on is uh, Storify. But we'll talk about Storify, but realize that we sort of mean a lot of these different things, even though they all have different uh, aspects. Problems with clicking here. One of the unifying aspects of these storytelling services is we have some large number of things, n number of things, where n is quite large. We want to sample some small number k that represents that n. There are a lot of things that do this. So um, now this is this is Jasmine's uh, uh, Facebook page, right? So uh, she's got uh, stories about the uh, Egyptian Revolution. She's got stories about her uh, small child and so forth. Lots of activity on her Facebook page, right? Then Facebook had this thing called Look Back. Right? Anyone use this? Anyone willing to admit they use this? Right. Everyone's being bashful about their social media. Uh, uh, so basically, this comes and generates a one-minute video of all of your Facebook activities, not all of your, a sampling of your Facebook activities for you know, however long you've been online, right? Mm -hmm. now, obviously, it's not gonna play everything because we've got too many, well, she's got too many baby pictures, I've got too many cat pictures, right? You can't <laughs> play them all. Uh, but you know, we'll come up with, I don't know, choosing the ones that people liked the most or had the most engagement with uh, commentary uh, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> Twitter has a capability for creating stories based on tweets and themed tweets and so forth. Anyone use this interface? So I'm just talking into a vacuum for uh, social media here. All right, yeah, okay, a couple of you. Um, anyone used one second every day? This is sort of outside of the Twitter Facebook aspect. This is a really cool service where if you take um, video, and people shoot on their phone video. Basically, it forces it and it won't let you cheat. It forces, takes one second of a video that you get to choose for every day. And so if you've been on vacation for you know, two weeks, you'll get a 14 second video that summarizes what you were doing every day. Now, the thing is, you probably have you know, 30, 45 minutes of video from your vacation, but we can distill it down into something very small, right? And that's the essence. We don't try to include everything. We just try to get a little taste of, of everything to convey the essence of what you did at a particular time. Right? So what I'm trying to convince you of is that storytelling is something, as our collections of social media are growing, there are a lot of things that are coming about that are sampling from the social media. There's a handful of things here. Um, one is these are popular services that people know how to use, right? Only a few people are admitting it, but you know, I don't know, ask your kids or something like that. They know, they know how to uh, uh, interact with this. All right. As cool as storytelling services are, there's a handful of limitations. All right. Here is a, um, a story on Storify that someone has created about a portion of the Egyptian revolution. So this is about Mubarak uh, resigning. And we have some tweets and some news stories, etc. 
when I go to click on one of the news stories, the New Zealand Herald has, and that page has now disappeared. It's 404. So essentially, storytelling services are actually acting as bookmarking services, not really archiving services, right? They're recording a link to that page, but not actually the content itself. So it's sort of useful in the immediate term, but from a, um, a scholarly or a historic uh, point of view, we can't really depend on these resources being there over the long time. Um, so they can disappear, they can go off topic. Um, this is something that uh, another student of mine, uh, Andy Salo Dean, studied about. Uh, he specifically studied social media about the Egyptian Revolution and the resources they linked to, and things disappeared at about the rate of 11% in the first year and about 7% uh, per year after that. So people are tweeting, they're posting pictures, they're making commentary about history as it unfolds but that material is not being made available to historians because it actually has a very high decay rate. All right, so what are we gonna do? All right, so storytelling's good, but it has some limitations. How are we gonna combine it with archives? Well, the idea here is the web is what we refer to as very, very big. So the people at Archive It, the subscribers, are creating various collections. And collections you can think of as sampling from the web choose a seed URI and decide this is important, that's not important, these are the things that I want to build a collection around. So a collection is a little sample of the web, but this little sample gets quite large over time, and the story becomes a little sample from the collection itself. Right? So we're going from big to small as we go left to right. So the idea here is we can take the Storify services, the storytelling services, people already know how to interact with them, right? They're popular services, they frequently use them, as opposed to things like tree maps, which I'm betting none of you have ever actually used, right? So we can't really rely on the semantic understanding of how to interact with a tree map. So we take these services, we sample from the collection, and we can hopefully give you a better idea of what to expect when you go to these various Egyptian revolution stories or these various human rights stories. We can look at the story, get an idea of the nature and characteristics of the story, of that uh, collection uh, uh, topic. So <clears throat> the focus here, the research question, is can we automatically identify candidates that pull from the collection that show up into the story. How do we choose K from a much larger end? All right. So archived collections have two dimensions. So we have the URIs that we're saving, and then we have the time frame in which they're captured. Right? So we can index things essentially by a URI and a time. This leads to, in these two dimensions, we're going to get four different kinds of stories. The first one is we have a single page, and we have a single point in time. You might think, how many different perspectives can you get by visiting the same page at the same time? Well, it turns out it's not just a single page. It's a single page as it's viewed on a particular device. Right? So in this case, we have a story as it shows up in a mobile browser, and a story as it shows up in a desktop browser. Now, in this particular story, it's sort of the same content reformatted. But oftentimes, especially for top-level pages, there are editorial decisions that are applied for its, um, what shows up above the fold and what does not, right? It's not always just the same content that is uh, uh, reformulated. More useful is to use the same page and show how it changes through time, right? So as a new story is unfolding, we go and we take snapshots of that story and you know more things blow up or more things burn down or something like that and the story unfolds. So here's an example for, um, I uh, can't tell which page is, I don't know, it doesn't matter, it's the same page. I can't read the URL for it. But we're changing through time and this is sort of, you can clearly see this is documenting the resignation of Mubarak as we go through and uh, you know, he says he won't uh, seek re-election, and then there's 
protests and then tanks move in and then more protests and eventually he resigns down here, right? So we have the same page and we're capturing these mementos and the story is unfolding for us. So we could go the other direction where we fix the time and then we sample from different seed pages, right? So the idea here is we want to contrast how at roughly the same time the story is being reported in different services, right? So CNN has a perspective, BBC has a perspective, the uh, uh, state um, uh, uh, newspaper of Egypt has a perspective, uh, you know. And so we have at roughly the same time, the day of the resignation, how this is being covered in all of the uh, major news outlets, right? So that's a different perspective. Another one is we're willing to vary in both dimensions, right? So willing to sample from different pages and we're willing to cover a broader uh, period of time. So in this case, we're sampling different pages and we're showing the progression of the story and we have a broader notion of what's happening in this collection, right? And so Sampling from these collections, this is an example of some handcrafted stories as they show up in the Storify interface, right? We get these nice little summaries and the title and the descriptions. And the idea is if we can cleverly sample these, then we'll have an idea of what's in the stories. Now there's other interfaces possible. Here's a timeline view of the same content, but you know, it's not that we're specifically championing uh, Storify. We're just trying to uh, interact with different interfaces. Of choosing K. All right. So where is Yasmin in her research? The first thing we're doing is establishing a baseline. And she, for establishing the archive collections that was done earlier, um, one of the things I want to talk about in a bit is what are the characteristics of good stories. Then the other aspect is analyzing the collection itself. Because especially for long-running collections, we want to identify pages that have gone off topic. So pages are chosen in a collection because they are about something, right? And given enough time, pages, if they go 404, that's easy to identify. If they become about cheap Rolexes, that's harder to identify. So, I mean, we can, humans are good at identifying uh, bad pages, um, but when determining when it's gone off topic, it's actually harder. This is especially hard because to generate a good story, we'd actually like to not have the same page over and over again. We'd actually like to increase the novelty. So it's not just that Mubarak resigns, but it's the next guy that comes in, and then he's resigned. So a lot of the names and a lot of the places are changing over time. And if we analyze this, we're going to see that actually few of the terms actually uh, line up. But we need to um, say so the guy after Mubarak was uh, CC. Morsi, right? So we go from Mubarak to Morsi. So we need to figure out that that's still on topic, even though the terms don't line up. But when we go from Mubarak to Rolexes, we need to decide, okay, very high novelty, so, so novel, in fact, that it's gone off topic, and we need to come back, right? So there's actually this sweet spot of finding something that's not just Mubarak, 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 but Mubarak and Morsi, and, and, but exclude the Rolexes. All right. And then the next thing we need to do is start generating and then evaluating the stories. Now, how do we evaluate a good story, right? If we have literally a million mementos to choose from, and we're going to choose, say, 20 mementos, there's, I don't know how many combinations, a gazillion combinations, right? How do we know if we've done a good job? And it's kind of like a Turing test. Our approach here for deciding if we've done a good job is we're gonna have manually generated stories, and they're gonna have automatically generated stories. Now, presumably, the manually generated stories are about people who are qualified to render, uh, make good selections about it, right? So Yasmin can make a good selection about the Egyptian Revolution uh, collection. So we'll take the manually generated stories and the automatically generated stories, and then we'll submit them to human evaluation. Anyone use Mechanical Turk? So for not people in my group, right? Anyone, anyone using Mechanical Turk right now to earn 10 cent while I talk? Um, 
So Mechanical Turk is a service where you, uh, um, you go online and do what they call human intelligence task. And it's often evaluating if things are relevant or good, or if there's a cat in that picture and not in that picture, that kind of thing. So the idea is if humans can't tell the difference between a manually good, good generated story and an automatic generated story, they somehow still capture the essence of what's in the collection, then we're going to call that a success. Right? If you can't tell the difference between manual and automatic, then we're going to be done. Okay, so that was covering going from big to small, right? Taking a collection, sampling a few things out, and, and creating a story. What about using stories to seed the web archiving collections? Now, what I hope I've convinced you of is that generating collections is actually really, really hard. Right? But it's something that humans tend to want to do, right? You create reading lists. I mean, creating a course is really like creating a collection. These are things we're going to talk about. These are the papers we're going to read. These are inbounds. That's out of bounds. It's something that we do, but you have to really know the topic uh, to do that. Now, it requires awareness and domain knowledge. So, um, as an American, I'm always surprised to find there are other parts of the world. Right. And so you might be surprised as well to find that news occurs in other parts of the world. Right? You don't get that from reading American uh, uh, US media, but things happen in other parts of the world. Um, but if you're not knowledgeable about these other parts of the world, how do you know that something interesting is happening? Right? Um, so you actually have to have some knowledge. And surprisingly, they don't speak English in all parts of the world. So if you want to capture it in their native language, uh, uh, then you actually have to have a uh, foreign language. And if, if you can speak more than one language, clearly you're not American, right? So, yeah, uh, so you know, you have to have the knowledge, you have to have awareness, right? Because what if it happens while you're sleeping, right? And if you're sleeping, you're obviously not in graduate school. So, uh, so, um, so we can crowdsource, right? We can sort of say, hey, who knows about a good, you know, something's happening here, who's going to inform us? But you, even before you know to ask for help from other people, you have to have some awareness that something interesting is happening. So on that idea, returning back to Archive It, here's an example or a, a screenshot of the collections that were about the Ukraine prior to early 2014. So we look, and there's some sites created by people at Georgetown University, and they were created around 2008. So it's you know blogs about Ukraine and some other sites, et cetera. Then, in February 2014, they created a collection about the conflict in the Ukraine, right? Something finally, you know, it ro rose to a certain level where we, you know, it showed up on CNN and we're like, hey, that probably is important. We should do something about it, right? Um, but, you know, so we have a collection about what's happening in Ukraine. The idea is it didn't just blow up one day, right? I mean, that's how we sort of get it in our media. But before it reached that point, there was a lot going on. Um, now, this is not about the Ukraine, because this example was about uh, Nelson Ma 